morning. Before we get into our, uh, our sermon this morning, this is Father's Day. And this morning we want to honor not just our fathers, but our mothers as well. We were just going through a busy time and Mother's Day sort of slipped past us. When we're reading the Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus, it was important enough for God to write it down for us to remember and to make it a command where he says, Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. My mom is now 94. She says she doesn't know how she got to be that age. But I still honor her as my mother. And I still honor my father, even though he has been with the Lord for the last 15 years. And we want to honor you, fathers and mothers, here at Scott Street today. What I'd like to do is, I I know that there are a number who are great-grandparents, but I don't know if there's anybody who is a great-great-grandparent here. Is there anyone here this morning who fits that? Mr. and Mrs. Bull and, <laughs> and, and the dolls, why don't, you, why don't you folks stand and let's honor them today as our great-great-grandparents. That's... God bless you. Now, how many are great-grandparents? Won't you stand this morning? Yeah. Somebody said, I thought all grandparents were great. (laughs) Okay. So, we've got great-great, we've got great And I'm standing, grandparents. How many are grandparents here today? Oh, yes. I used to have a little sign on my desk that says, if I'd known grandkids were so much fun, I would have had them first. And then we have our parents, mothers and fathers. Would you stand this morning? Yeah. We honor you, and we bless you today, and we've seen in our bulletins we have some parents again that are uh, celebrating the birth of a little girl, and we've had a number of births over the last few months, and it is awesome to see that. One of the ways that my wife and I honor her parents, even though her dad has been dead for a few years, is when we were planning to get married we chose their anniversary to be our wedding date. And then she discovered that her mother's wedding ring fit her, so she wears her mother's wedding ring from their anniversary, and we had her father's fixed and resized for me, and so I honor a man I never met every day. And I, folks, I I really think that we should honor and respect and appreciate those that have been so faithful in raising kids and those that are about to embark on that as well. They all need our prayers and our support. So mothers and fathers, happy Mother's Day, happy Father's Day. Blessed are you on the Lord's Day today. Amen? Well, let's turn in our scriptures, if you would, to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, and we have, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Sabrina gave an amazing history of the book of Colossians and, and where Paul was coming from. And there were different times when, see, Paul was extremely practical in the ways that he taught the early Christians how to live the Christian life. And in some of his writings, uh, he had to draw a very clear picture of why the gospel was superior 
to the Jewish teachings with their sacrifices and their earthly high priest, like he did in the book of Hebrews. Other times, he had to uh, give a well-reasoned brief as to the merits of Christ and the sufficiency of the gospel, such as he did in the book of Romans. But here he is speaking to new Christians, to those very young in the faith, and they needed some guidance in their newfound spiritual journey in Christ. So he calls them to their remembrance, the faith that they exhibited by receiving Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. He says in verse 6, it says, Just as you received Jesus Christ as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. Or, if we were to paraphrase it, in the same way that you received by faith, continue living that way. So he says, do not forget. Don't forget the basics of your faith. And he says, continue. Keep on doing the things that make you strong. So, I have a question. How are we doing with that? How's it going for us? Are we still living up to the knowledge that we have received? Over the years, I, I've talked to numbers of people that says, well, you know, I don't know much left yet. And I would ask them, say, well, what are you doing with what you do know? Are you putting into practice the things that you do know already as you wait for more knowledge to come? See, God is very faithful, and he doesn't waste anything, as we saw with you Look at the journeys in the, in the wilderness and the manna. It, it wasn't wasted. They would take just enough, and then he would give us that much again the next day. So are we doing what we know we should be doing? And I think if we're honest with ourselves, every one of us would say, you know, I really could improve in that area. I really could improve because sometimes I forget what I should be doing, and I get caught up in doing all the other things that are around me, and all the immediate sometimes takes precedence over the necessary. So, we need not make excuses and do things our own way when we know what the right thing is to do. Well, Paul then gives us some very practical tools to help us to do this. He says, be rooted in him. I, I love gardening. I really do. And I hope it rains a little bit more today. I really do, uh, because we had so much rain earlier that we said, please stop, and whoever prayed, please stop, stop praying that. We could use a little bit more rain now. But you see, when I plant, I plant the roots down deep into the soil so that it has a good hold and the moisture is able to get down and the roots are able to establish themselves. And that's what we're to do in Christ. We're, we're to let our roots go down deep, and we, we just hold on getting our nutrients from him. Not shallow, but deep. In the parable of the soils, one of the type of soils was a, a soil that was a stony ground. And the complaint about that was they, they weren't able to get roots down deep. And as soon as the sun came up scorching, they'd dry up and blow away. And we've all seen the old western movies where you see the tumbleweeds going across the ground in the wind. And unfortunately, there are many Christians that their lives are like that. They, they confess Jesus as Lord, and that's all they've done. And so when persecution comes, they have a hard time holding on. He says, be rooted in him. And then he says, be built up in him. And that's just a way of saying we need to mature. We need to grow up. And we need to continue to be growing. There's things I'm learning every day. Things that I'm learning as you go through Scripture. And that's the wonderful thing about the Word of God. It's not a stagnant book. The Bible says it's living and active. It's powerful. It's like a two-edged sword that just cuts away all of my excuses in my heart. And keeps me on the edge. And it's practical for every day. And so it says, learn how to stand fast on our own two feet as Christians. And that's what comes from maturing and growing up. Well, thirdly, he says, we need to be strengthened in the faith. How? 
as you were taught. Again, taking heed to the things. Now, in order for me to have been taught something, I had to be paying attention. I had to be listening. Have you ever been accused of somebody talking to you and they knew you weren't listening? Well, let me turn that around. Have you ever been talking to someone and you knew by the look in their face they were someplace else? Well, I talked about this in Sunday school this morning. We have, we have phrases for that, you know, like, you know, the lights are on, but there's nobody home. <laughs> you know, the, the elevator didn't go all the way to the, to the top floor. You know, we, we talk about that. And don't you love those times when you're talking to someone and you, there's, a, there's a blank look on their face as if, Huh? See, I need to be paying attention. Now, when I was uh, learning how to play uh, guitar and and play at the piano, I would always watch people and watch what they did. And if they did something, I said, how did you do that? How did you do that? And and I would watch them. They'd show me how to do it. And I would start to do it and start to practice it so that it became part of what I did. But I had to pay attention. It says, that I was strengthened in my faith. And why I ask for the great-grandparents and great-grandparents and grandparents to stand, because you're the ones who showed us how to do it. You're the ones who showed us how to live a Christian life in a world that's going the opposite direction. You showed us how to do it. And we needed to pay attention. Young people, we need, we need to pay attention. Because there's principles. We might not do it exactly the same way, but there's principles we need to learn from those who have been in the faith. And the fourth thing he says, and do it all, how? Overflowing with thankfulness. See, that's good advice for young Christians. He says, be rooted in him, be built up, be strengthened in your faith, and and do it all with thankfulness, overflowing in your heart. You see, all these things speak to the the maturity and the stability that, that we have on a daily basis. Now, James tells us that if we hear only and do not do what we're hearing, we are deceiving ourselves. We're fooling ourselves. There's a lot of things we hear, but if we don't do it, he says we're, we're, we're like someone who looks in the, the mirror and we, we can't remember what we looked like when we walked away. We deceive ourselves. You see, growth only comes when we put into practice the things that we are learning and seeing in others. In fact, Paul told the Philippians, he says, Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. So, why do we need to mature? I mean, why do we need to grow up? There's a a toy company that their ad is, I don't ever want to grow up. Toys are us. Well, that's great if you're selling toys. But if you're living the life, there's a time we need to grow up. We need to mature. You see, why do we need to be strong enough to stand on our own and not be spiritual babies all the rest of our lives? Well, Paul says, tests will come. Trials are going to come. Problems are going to come. How many have found that's true in your life this past week? Oh my goodness, we're not alone. And you thought you were the only one going through a trial. See, tests will come, and they usually don't come when we're in a gathering of believers or in the middle of a Bible study. No, they usually come when you are not around others that you might otherwise gain strength from. Again, we talked about that in Family Life Hour when we watched the nature documentaries The wolves or the lions like to separate someone from the group, get them isolated. Because when they're isolated, they're easier to take down. There's a lot of people say, I don't need to go to church. Well, let me warn you, folks. The Bible says we need to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And the reason for that is when we're off in isolation, we become prey to all kinds of things. We draw strength from each other. We draw strength from our corporate worship and praise. So, verse 8, there's a warning. 
It says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental forces of this world, rather than on Christ. And I got to tell you, there is going to be those, and there have been those, who will try to water down the message of Christ. Why? Because they are operating by a different spiritual system. They are operating by the basic principles of the world and not of Christ. Here's a problem. Standards of morality in the world keep shifting. Things that were unacceptable 50 years ago, all of a sudden in the world's eyes are not only acceptable, but are being promoted today. Things that 50 years ago would have brought down the ire of an entire nation is now being supported by a supposedly Christian nation. See, in Romans chapter 1, there's a picture painted of a godless culture that's pushing and pushing away from God. And three times in that chapter, it says, God gave them up. Okay, you get the picture. They are pushing against God, pushing, and then God just steps back. And then they start pushing and pushing again, and God steps back. And then they keep pushing and pushing again. It said three times, God gave them up. And then they pushed even further. And see, here's, here's the problem that we address. Some say the church needs to shift with it, with the world. But we need to have a standard. We need to hold on to the word of God as truth and as the only standard for life and time and eternity. We need to take this word and say, on the word of God, I will base my life. Not on the shifting sands of the culture in which we live. But everybody's doing it. No, not everybody. Because we will not be doing it. Because the word of God is truth. But, having said that, we need to apply the truth in every situation. But here's the key. We need to apply it with love. Why do I say that? Over the years, there have been different ways that people have used the Bible. And some of those ways have not been bathed with love. I'm ashamed to say that. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says, The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. See, two people can use the same Bible in, in vastly different ways. One can allow the Holy Spirit to open up a truth in a situation that leads to understanding and a holy change, but the other can use it like a club. And they try to beat you into submission, and they threaten you with fighting against God if you don't obey. Let me give you a couple of examples. There's, there's a lot of you who were around in the 50s and 60s. There are some of you who weren't. But after the war, women were starting to flex their individuality as they were the ones who had to look after their families and earn a living while their husbands were off at the war, regardless of where that war was in the world. And as they began to flex their individuality, some of the men didn't like it. They didn't like the fact that their wives suddenly had an opinion. See, the letter of the law states, wives, 
obey your husband in everything. Wives, be in subjection to your own husband. And this is biblical. I mean, you can look in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, you can look in Ephesians chapter 5, and, and, and even, in fact, Paul is going to touch on it later in this letter as well. And many men and preachers would try to beat their women into subjection using the word of God as a club. But the balance was left out. You see, the balance was that the same scripture passage would also say, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And how did he do that? He died for the church. He gave his life for the church. You show me a man who is willing to die for his wife and I'll show you a wife that has no trouble following her husband as her spiritual head. That is the word applied with love. Second example. I got this when I was a kid. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. How many got that one? How many heard the other side of it? Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. I have very seldom heard that part. But you see, the one without the other is bullying. The one coupled in love with the other one is relationship. Where we have a relationship with each other and together we realize we are making our way through life into eternity. One is meant to instruct and protect. The other is meant to bully. And just because the world does it doesn't mean the church has to do it. The world is out there trying to bully the church into subjecting to their standards. But even as we learned last week in our family life hour, there comes a time when it says we need to obey God rather than man. As Daniel says, no, I'm going to obey my God. And he prayed three times a day. Today is Father's Day. And men, your wives, your children, your grandchildren are looking for a man who will dare to stand up for Jesus and who will dare to let the word of God be his rule for life and eternity. 1 Corinthians 16 says, Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Do everything in love. The King James says, Quit you like men. Or act like a man. Is what it's saying. Men, stand up. Show your wife and your children what it means to love them and live for Jesus. Can you say amen to that? Got some work to do on that one. Now verses 9 and 10 says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. All we need is Christ. We are complete in him. 2 Peter chapter 1 says, His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called you by glory and virtue. Let's look at that. All things. That's a very inclusive word. It doesn't say most things or a few of the things. It says all things. All things that you need. There's nothing left out. How many of you ever, have ever uh, gotten a kit to put together, maybe a, a cupboard or, a, or a, a chair or a, even a model airplane? How many have ever gotten those kits and you go to put it together and there's pieces missing? Oh, that used to frustrate me. Now they've gotten smart. They send extra pieces. Or at least there are when I'm done putting it together. Okay, confession time here. 
Men, how many of you read the instructions before you start? How many end up building it three times because you have to build it, unbuild it, and build it again? <laughs> See, when it comes to our relationship in Christ, everything's in the package. All the parts, all the instructions, all the tools, it's all in there. We, all things, for what? For life and godliness. So everything that we need to live this life and everything that we need for our spiritual life as well, it's in the package. It's complete. It says, in him is all the fullness of the Godhead, of the deity. So we don't have to look in other places because everything we need is in Christ. So, why do we look other places? Why do we look other places other than Christ? Why do we continue to look all over the place for what we think we need? And we so often go after this speaker or, or that speaker or, or this author or that author. Then what we're doing, if we're honest, what we're trying to do is we're trying to hitch a ride on their spiritual experience. We don't trust Christ enough to experience it on our own, so we just read about them. Or we listen to them. And they say, this is what God did for me. And we don't say, well, hey, God can do it for me too. And we try to hitch a ride on their spiritual experience. I, I remember one, one church I was in. We were in a, in a service and God was just blessing people in a, in a wonderful way. And I remember somebody saying, I just wanted to reach out and touch that person and see if I get some of it. Wow. See, everything we need, all of us, it's available through Christ. Jesus is ready and waiting to give us the richest, fullest experience of our own. But you know, this, even this isn't new. Uh, the church back in Paul's day was doing the, the very same thing. Back in Corinth, and, and we read in Corinthians chapter 3, he says they were bragging about, well, I follow Peter, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Paul, or oh no, I follow Jesus, I follow Christ. So they were doing it back then, and they're still doing it today. They say, oh, I like him better, or oh, I don't like him, or I like her, or I don't like her. It's amazing how we have taken objective worship of God to be an subjective experience of ours. Where instead of it all being about him, it all becomes about us. Say, well, I don't like this. Well, the question is, does he? Does Christ? Sometimes we tend to lift up certain people as being more spiritual or more holy or, or more in tune with God. But we need to remember, these are just people like, like you and me. In James chapter 5, it says, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And again, he prayed. And I think maybe therein lies the secret. Maybe that's the point that we need to make here on Father's Day. Because we, we need men who pray and pray again. You say, but all, oh, you don't know the struggles that I go through. You don't know the struggles that I go through with the media, with the culture. You, you don't know the struggles that I go through. Well, God said, Elijah had a nature just like ours. And Elijah was also the guy who, after fighting a tremendous spiritual battle and victory on Mount Carmel, where fire came down from heaven to consume the sacrifice, the next chapter, you see him running and hiding, saying, God, you might as well kill me. 
Why? Well, the queen's mad at me. Well, why shouldn't she be? You just killed 850 of her false prophets. She fed them at her table. And you killed them all. You said, oh, you might as well kill me. I'm alone. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. And God says, I'm sure if, if, if God the Father was standing beside Elijah right then, he would have stood beside him, raised his hand, smacked him in the back of the head. He said, listen, buddy. Just so you know, I've got 7,000 in this land who are just like you. 7,000 who have not bowed their knee to Baal. You're not alone. But the difference was he prayed, and then he prayed again. Now the rest of this passage that was read to us early reminds us that this is where we all came from. Every one of us. No exceptions. We were all guilty of sin. And at that one, we all hang our heads. We all needed a Savior. And for that one, we all look up. We all needed to be baptized, as Scripture said. And that's my public confession. And we all needed our past life of sin erased. Verse 14 says, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Oh. Have you ever had a debt forgiven? Do you remember the feeling of freedom? When it was gone. And Jesus took our whole debt of sin. He took it. He nailed it to the cross. Where he might as well have, have, have written on it. Paid in full. There used to be a song that says, I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt I didn't, he did not owe. I, I needed someone to wash my sins away. So he canceled the charge. You want, you want to hear about my hero today? Today's Father's Day. Many of our families are out celebrating with their father, which is great. And a lot of kids look up to their dad as their hero. You want to hear about my hero? I've got two. One was my earthly father. who worked hard to provide a living for us. Who sacrificed his own health to better his position in life, to earn a living, to look after my mother and us kids. And over the course of those years, even though he suffered with asthma, he coughed just like I do. He had three, three massive strokes. He had kidney stones, stone in the bladder, blood poisoning, collapsed lungs, triple bypass, minor stroke during surgery. They said he'd never be out of the hospital. He'd never eat again. He had a trach tube in. But uh, on his 80th birthday... He was sitting at home eating cake. You couldn't tell my dad he couldn't do something. And the only reason he let go in February of 20, 2002 is because we went and we stood by his bed and said, Dad, we'll look after Mom. Just a couple hours later, he slipped into eternity. He's one of my heroes. And my other hero is my heavenly father, who took that huge debt of sin 
and wickedness and evil that I could never pay for. And he nailed it to the cross. And he remembers it no more. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. My friends, that's why I can trust in Jesus. Verse 15 says, Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. That's why I can trust in Jesus. And that's who I want to pattern my life after. And so fathers... Take up the challenge. Be that man of God. 